Shalom, everyone. Boker Tob. Welcome to Thursday Bible Study. We've been uh, looking at Exodus, and today we're going to look at chapters 26 and 27. So let's just open in prayer. Father God, um, just open our hearts and our minds today, Lord, to your word. Help us to find all those little hidden things that you have for us as we search out your word, Lord. And uh, we just thank you so much for, uh, for the blessings of today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, our scripture for today is Psalm 27.1. The Lord is my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Boy, if we can just print that in our hearts and keep it every time we have a little uh, misgiving or, or a little doubt in our minds, just remember, remember. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now today the Book of Mysteries uh, is day 52, and it is Yamim Noraim. And I guess I better get my right book here. Page 52. Yes, today is the most holy day for the Jews, um, Yom Kippur. And of all days, it's today. Wow. Actually, it started yesterday. Yeah, last night, evening. yes. Uh, their days it start in the evening, evening yeah. and it would have been last okay. night. And it will go through, yeah, 25 hours. And that is the same as Shabbat. Uh, Shabbat goes for 25 hours. There. And I wondered, well, why one more hour, you know? But they said uh, it's probably because uh, they want to honor. It's a, such a special time, they don't want to let go of it. And so they want to just have a little more time. And so they've added one more hour just because of its specialness. So. All righty, day 52. The days that open the Hebrew month of Tishri, he said, from the Feast of Trumpets to Yom Kippur, are viewed as the holiest time of the biblical calendar. Why? Well, they're the days of repentance. When the shofar sounds on the Feast of Trumpets, it signals only 10 days remain until Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is linked to the sealing of one's eternal destiny as on the day of judgment. Well, that's something serious to think about. But it's not just these two days that are considered most holy, but all 10. Together they're called Yamim Noraim, the days of awe, or the awesome days. Why awesome? Because their end is linked to the final day of judgment. So they declare that one doesn't have forever to repent or to make thing right, things right. One only has these set days before it's all sealed. You know, if we only, if we had that feeling, you know, that we have only a few more days left, we'd get serious with things, but we, because we don't know why we think, well, we've got plenty of time, but we don't know when God's going to call us. So they must be pretty intense. They are. During the days of awe, observant Jews do everything they can to get right with God, to make things right with others, to forgive and be forgiven, to repent, to seal up loose ends, and to right what was wrong. It all has to be finished before the sun sets on the eve of Yom Kippur. But does this apply to us now in Messiah? Well, the days of awe are a shadow of something much greater, for the days you have on earth are not forever. They have an appointed end, and at their end comes eternity, beginning with the day of judgment when your destiny is sealed, for one eternity or the other. And the only time you have to determine that eternity are the, eternity are the days of this life, the days you now have on earth. Once they end, they're sealed. So these are the only days you will ever have to get right with God, to make things right with others, and to do right what is to right what is wrong. So if you would ever get right with God, get right with God now. And if you would ever make things right with others, make things right with them now. If you would ever rise to your calling, rise now. And whatever good you would ever do in your life, do it now. For the time you have left on earth is nothing less than the yamin noraim, your days of awe. So the mission today is to look at the remainder of your days of life in a new way as a Yamin Noreem. Get right with God and those in your life for today is a day of awe. So, something very serious to think about and they are very serious about it. And they have until their uh, sunsetting tonight. I'm, I'm assuming that maybe it's already happening or very close to, you know, with the time difference but um, th very serious. So um, we have a little video 
Uh, well, I'm gonna save the video. We're gonna have the, uh, the song first. Uh, we're gonna go into the uh, Hebrew <coughs> word study and then we'll have a little video. Um, I've chosen uh, the word yom today because that was part of uh, the title of the Book of Mysteries day. Yom means day, Y-O-M, yom. Now, if you want to say days, it's yamim. So it changes a little bit. So you've got that on your, uh, on your, in your notes there. Now we say, um, have a good day. In Hebrew, it would be yom tov. Yom tov. Tov is good. So, so you can see yom is day and tov is good. All right. Now, there's a little video. There's a little song I found, and I thought it was kind of cute because it's uh, something that we've uh, talked about before. Um, Baruch Hashem Yom Yom, bless the Lord every day. When, when you say Yom Yom, it means every day, when you double it up. So um, here's the little video. Uh, let me see if I can drag it up here. I thought it was kind of cute, and maybe it'll help us remember it. Okay, let's see here. Should we just hit the space bar? Oh, okay. Okay. I'm very upset. We're only a few weeks away from the release. I don't have a singer for the last song. I don't know what I'm going to do. This is horrible. Welcome to the old California. Such a lovely place. Such a lovely place. Hey, David. Not bad. 83 shekels. 83 shekels? Yes. How am I supposed to pay my electric bill at the end of the month with 83 shekels? Come on, David. You have a wrong perspective. You don't see where. Baruch Hashem, Yom Yom. Yeah, it's easier said than done. It's not enough to say. You have to sing it. my eyes and my heart starts to sing and step into the rhythm that this new day brings i'm living in the moment gonna make it mine and take it one day at a time with an attitude of joy and gratitude sure there's worry and there's fear but i'm not going there i'm out to find the blessings and opportunity that's waiting right there just for me Cause I know today's the day to lift my hands up high and say Baruch Hashem, yoimi, yoimi, yoim Tomorrow's far away, I'll be singing come what may Baruch Hashem, yoim, yoim With this force of energy, I got all I need in me Baruch Hashem, yoimi, yoimi, yoim Hashem has got my back, so there's nothing that I lack Baruch Hashem, yoim, yoim Joy and gratitude, sure there's worry and there's fear, but I'm not going in there. I'm not to find the blessings and opportunity that's waiting right there just for me. Oh, cause I know today's the day to lift my hands up high and say, Baruch Hashem, yoy, yoy, yoy. Tomorrow's far away, I'll be singing, come what may. Baruch Hashem, yoy,
How are you? This is Pinchas Wolf. Pinchas Wolf? Wow, Shalom Aleichem, how are you? Listen, I heard you sing the beautiful song. Oh, thank you so much. I want to feature you singing this song on my upcoming album. Wow, that would be a tremendous honor. What do you say? Um, okay, how much can you pay me for that? All I have right now, uh, what I can afford is 83 shekels. 83 shekels? Not bad. Then we have a deal. Thank you. Take care. Okay, we're done with this one. Now, how do I turn it off? Okay. <laughs> space bar, space bar. <laughs> get away from me, get away from me. I hit both bars. Oh, well, that looks good. Oh, hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. Okay. Am I on? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So we've uh, enjoyed that little song. It's real catchy. I, I like it because it's just kind of repetitive. But, uh, you know, God is good every day. It's just kind of an uplifting little thing. Um, but it gets in our mind, you know. Baruch uh, Baruch Baruch Hashem. Yom Yom. Uh, Baruch Hashem. Baruch is blessed. Hashem is the name because they don't pronounce the name of God. It's too holy. So they call him the name. So Baruch Hashem. Yom Yom every day. So, okay. Um, and so we know that better cause blessings. So uh, that's our little word study today. Everybody should know Yom by now. Yom Yom. Um, Today is the holiest day, the Yom Kippur, and um, it's kind of an interesting time because everything shuts down in Israel, uh, even for those who are not uh, religious. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you can't drive, there are so many things that you can't do, and let me find my notes here that I was, uh, I put them in the wrong spot. As usual, I'm kind of... But um, there are so many things that they can't do uh, on this day. They, everybody fasts. You have to fast all day. Um, you can't take a bath. You can't even wash your face. You can't brush your teeth. <laughs> you can't wear leather shoes. Now, I'm not sure what that's all about. That's one of their rules. Um, no relationships with, you know, your partner. Um, they pretty much just have to think about repentance. Teshuva is repentance. This is the day that they, and, and all through the week, you know, this is the time that they are to think about repenting and, and turning away from what they've done all year long and they want to make it right with God. And so that's what they're supposed to be doing today is just concentrating on that. And, and part of not eating is focusing on the Lord rather than on your physical needs. That's why, I suppose, why they don't wash or do anything like that, because it's just all about the Lord. And uh, when they go to synagogue, they wear white. I thought that was kind of interesting, because we know what white means, purity. Uh, and so, um, a, lot of, a lot of things going on. So we've got a little video. Um, Sergio and Rhoda have been making films all along this past uh, few months, because of Everything's been shut down so much in Israel, they haven't been able to really do a lot, but they have been able to make a few films. So now they're, they're releasing them. And uh, this is one, uh, I don't think they made it just lately, but I, it's for Yom Kippur, and it shows Jerusalem and just what, what it's like there. So I thought, it's just about four minutes of it that I thought I'd like you to, to uh, just imagine if you were living there, what, what it would be like. So here we go. <laughs> 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 no. 
listen. Hi, this episode we're not gonna show you a specific location. Instead, we're gonna talk about and show you an event. Which event is it? Yom Kippur. That's right, the Day of Atonement. Now, the religious Jews have been keeping it for the past 3,000 years. What do they do in Yom Kippur? Well, it's very much like... Um, Sabbath. That's right, yeah. But... Well, yeah, but they fast. fast. Yeah, in Hebrew, it's Tzom, and so they greet each other here before the holiday, before the holiday, before this event, or before this day, they greet each other Tzom Kal, have a easy, easy fast, fast yeah. which is kind of fun. Everybody laughs about it because the fast is not supposed to be easy, but that's what they say. It's tradition. Yeah. But what happens to the rest of about 70% of the people in Israel who don't keep the fast and don't care about committing work on that day? Because that day, work shuts down. You can't turn on the light, you can't turn off the light, you can't work, you can't drill, you can't pretty much do anything except Praise God, ask for forgiveness. Go to the synagogue. Synagogue, yeah. Walk so, everywhere. Right. <laughs> so it's an official day off in Israel, but it's more than that. It is the only day of the year, and I think this is the only country in the world that does this, where the streets, the roads in Israel shut down. Completely. No, not just your local small roads in the city, no. In entire Israel, the highways, the bridges, the interstate, everything shuts down. Except for Arabic villages and Arabic places. That's right. So downtown in Nazareth, it still is occupational and that's why yeah. many Jews, they come here even a day before so they yeah. can do things. They come mm. to Nazareth, they go to the Arabic cities. Yeah. Now think of this. If there is nobody on the road, what happens to the 70% of the Jews that don't keep the law and don't uphold the tradition? What do they do? They play on their bicycles. That's right. This is the funnest day of the year for most Israelis. When I was growing up here, this day of the year is the day we all look forward to because on this day, you take out your bicycle, you take your scooter, you take your rollerblades, and you go on the streets and you have fun. <laughs> yes. You can literally take your bicycle and go on the highway, something similar to an interstate, on a bridge. It is incredible. So the drone footage you saw in the opening of the episode was taken by my good friend Mike, who actually lives in Nazareth Elite. He got a chance to lay in the middle of an intersection on a very busy street in Nazareth Elite, which otherwise would be impossible to do. But just on this day, he could lie down, take his drone and have him hover above him. It's incredible. So this day of atonement that the Jews kept for 3,000 years, it is incredible. Because in the Torah, God says to the Jews to do something very specific. Take two goats, take one goat, scapegoat, release it, the other goat, keep and slaughter it, and then it don't for this. There are so much specific details in that day, which begs the question, why all of this? What does it stand for? And rabbis throughout generations tried to explain it. But there is something behind it that is unbelievably incredible. It points to Christ in ways that makes my hair stand, mm -hmm. in ways that will make your jaw open, drop open and brain go, wow. Yeah, that's the expression. <laughs> so if you want to find out how and what am I talking about, you got to watch the sermon by Charlie Garrett from the Superior Word Church. It's down in the link below. Click that link. you got to watch that sermon. I promise you, if you know who Jesus is, this will blow your mind away. Yeah. Um, Charlie Garrett is a pastor out of Sarasota. <laughs> He's an interesting guy. He looks like a hippie. He's got a long beard, long, skinny guy. He was in the Air Force. Uh, he's married to a, a little Asian gal, and um, he's a wonderful man. I just I've watched him for a long time. He's just real solid in his uh, uh, Christianity, uh, but he is a nonconformist. I mean, he <laughs> but he just goes out every week. He goes out and to helps people in the uh, that live in the. Uh, sections of the town, you know, that need help. And every Saturday he's done that 
without, unless he was sick. You know, he goes out with a few people and goes out and prays for them, sees if he can help them in any way. He's just a wonderful guy. Lives simply. He's got a family, of course. Um, but uh, just a really neat guy. But he he's pretty solid in his teaching. And uh, this, uh, yeah, I would recommend it if you wanted to watch him um, concerning the Yom Kippur. So uh, that would be a good thing. We might even watch a bit of it here if I look into it and kind of pick out pieces of it. Uh, because it, it usually goes at least an hour. <coughs> but um, anyway, uh, Yom Kippur is an interesting interesting time, I think, for us to uh, consider too. Um, because it does, of course, point to uh, our Messiah, our to Jesus. Okay. Uh, last week uh, we uh, talked about the table of showbread and uh, the menorah. And we learned that uh, the table of showbread was to have 12 loaves of bread, one for each uh, tribe of Israel. And it was also um, to be, um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, well, it, the bread also represents Christ, you know, because he is the bread that cam came down from heaven. So um, it has multiple meanings. They saw it as representing the tribes at that time. Um, it was to be made of unleavened matzah. Somebody asked last week whether it was leavened or unleavened, and it was unleavened. Um, I think the only time they have leavened bread presented was, was Shavuot. Or was it first fruits? <laughs> One of the spring feasts, anyway, where, where they lift up two loaves, and, and um, but all the rest are unleavened because the unleavened is a picture of sin, and it represents Messiah being sinless. So he's the matzah, he's the bread, he would be sinless. Um, the other th reason is, uh, there was a practical reason, because they would present the bread, the... Day, let me see, um, I'm trying to think. It would be baked on Friday, and then it would be placed there for a week. And then the next Shabbat, so see, it they would have it there for a whole week. So if it was fresh and, and leavened, it wouldn't be any good by the time they ate it. But this, the matzah was still good when they ate it. So at the end of, sh of that Shabbat, of, that, um, of their day, the seventh day, then the priests that were on duty would eat that bread, and then it would be replaced as soon as they ate the bread <coughs> that that evening. They'd get fresh bread. So, um, three times a year, all the people were to come to the temple. You know, there were seven feasts, but there were three feasts when all people were required to come. And... Um, The Kohanim, that's what the priests were called, the Kohanim, uh, would tell them and when they were, they'd point to the bread and they'd say, look how God has, has beloved you uh, by providing your bread. So they used that as a symbol to the people that God would provide for them, just like he provided the manna. So that was a, a perpetual thing for them to do in the, in the tabernacle and in the temple later. Um, then we talked about the menorah being the only light source in the tabernacle, just as Yeshua is our, our light source, our only light source. And so the menorah is a picture of Messiah. Um, if you look at the word menorah, we found the word or, which means light, smack in the middle of the word menorah. Now, uh, you know, God did that on purpose, I'm sure, because when you look at the menorah, what is that center uh, lamp called? There are three branches. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. The six branches come out from that vine on the menorah, and the center is the shamish, which is the servant lamp, and that is a picture of Yeshua. That is the lamp that would be lighted all the time, and then they would use that lamp to light all the others, just as we get our light from uh, Jesus, uh, that lamp is lit as a picture of Messiah. So it all ties together. 
So it just is fitting that the, the word itself would have light right in the middle of it. If you go to Revelation 4, 5, it talks about the seven lamps of fire. And um, I know there's always speculation, well, what are those uh, seven spirits of God? There, there are three possibilities. It could be a picture of the Holy Spirit because number seven is perfection, so it'd be the seven spirits of God. It could be seven angel beings like the cherubim that are surround him. The, the third possibility is Isaiah 11:2, and many people point to this, the spirit of the Lord, uh, seven spirits uh, listed here in Isaiah. Spirit of the Lord, of wisdom, understanding, of counsel, of power, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. So take your pick, or maybe it's all three, I don't know. <laughs> it would be like the Lord to be all three, because so many, you know, so many depths of meaning with ev in everything, it, it's very possible it could cover everything. So these seven lamps are, are important and, and we see them showing up in all throughout the Bible. So let's go ahead and start Exodus 26 and we're gonna read one through six. And uh, this time we're gonna be looking at the linens that the Lord required for the tabernacle. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of fine twined linen, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and you shall make them with carabim skillfully worked into them. Now, I mistakenly, a week or two, talked about maybe the ladies embroidering these on there. Well, I, after doing some more research, they were woven into them. They were not embroidered. So that would be even more difficult. <laughs> so, interesting there. Um, remember the fine twined linen uh, came from Egypt, and they were known for the best uh, this fine twine linen is a twisted type of linen. And I found it very interesting, if you've ever read about the, the Shroud of Turin, and they believe that to be the Shroud of uh, Messiah, uh, that linen is twisted. It was very expensive linen. So the other thing that, speaking of the Shroud of Turin, that little video that we watched a week or two ago, uh, and it showed um, uh, the um, grave where Jesus had been laid, the tomb, and it showed where they'd cut out because the person, the last person, had been tall, uh, taller than average, and so they cut out for the feet. Well, the Shroud of Turin, he was six feet tall, who, the, the person that was wrapped in that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these things all seem to tie together just to show, you know, truth. I believe the truth is showing. So, anyway, um, back to uh, the linens. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits, and the breadth of each curtain, four cubits. All the curtains shall be the same size. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtains in the first set. Likewise, shall you shall make loops on the edge of the outermost curtain for the second set. 50 loops you shall make on one curtain, and 50 loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is in the second set. And the loops shall be opposite one another, and you shall make 50 clasps of gold, and a couple of the, couple of the curtains one to the other with clasps, so that the tabernacle may be a single whole. Okay, we're going to stop there and look back at that. There's a lot of little, a lot of stuff to try to figure out here. Um, curtains were to be all the same size and it comes out they were 42 feet long, six feet wide, and we're still on this premise that you can divide by three. Isn't that interesting? Still the measurements come out to that. I just, y you can just keep on going and, and they all seem to do that. The measurements, oh I have it, have it here, uh, the number for Trinity, you know. Now two groups of five, uh, so you have the ten curtains, so you got five curtains here, five curtains here, Five is grace, and they're to be coupled together. And the Hebrew word coupled means locked together like sisters. Well, maybe you didn't have a good relationship with your sister, but a lot of sisters you do, you know, and this is what the meaning is. It's to be united. And uh, it made me think of when I was a kid and we used to play Red Rover, Red Rover, you know, send so-and-so right over, and boy, you just try so hard not to let them break through. Well, that's what it is. You know, when you're united, 
when you've got your arms locked together, you're so much more strong than just doing it yourself. And that's, that's, uh, that's a picture here of, of what uh, we need to learn, is how, how unity is important. And just as we, sh we gather today, you know, together here, and we are in unity, uh, believing in our Lord and Savior, uh, that makes us united, and uh, we, we have uh, companionship here and share our, our uh, prayer requests and uh, our praises, and it just makes us all so much stronger to be able to do that. It's just a wonderful thing. So that's, God wants us to do that. Uh, I was reading uh, just last night, and it said, what is the one thing that uh, makes people most happy or most... Um, content, I, that's not really the word I'm looking for, but, uh, but you understand what I'm saying. And that is having companionship, having someone around that you can share things with. That is more important than anything uh, to our health. And so uh, God knows what we need. Just like laughter is the best medicine. You know, when you're in unity, you can laugh. You, can, you have something to share with someone. Okay, um, now the 50, you know, it said 50 loops. 50 is the year of Jubilee, and this is the year of Jubilee, and what happens on those years? The Jews would, uh, six years they were to uh, plant their crops, and then the seventh year they were to leave them fallow, not to, not to turn them over. It was a time for resting, and it's been proven uh, as Israel became a nation, uh, they found that those who kept that, and there were very few, but there were, uh, different little areas of farms, you know, that would, that were very strict in their keeping of the law, and they would not plant, and that if they found that they had greater crops the following years, you know, to make up for it, and, and the other people that just planted every year, sometimes that seventh year would fail, and so uh, God is really good in his promises, you know, and, and he set this up to be that way. So this is the year of Jubilee. This is a year of uh, returning. It, it um, it's, should be a good year for us, and well, for the Jews especially, but I think we're connected to the, to the Jewish uh, um, country. I believe that God has used us mightily, you know, for his work and, and to support Israel all these years, and, and I, th I think we're still connected uh, to Israel, and so I think we would be blessed. We, there's still many, many Christians here. You know, we think that our country is gone. It just looks like it's gone down the drain, but I, I still believe that God has plans for us and still has work for us to do. So um, I, I think this could also uh, reflect on us as well as on the Jews. So um, blue stands for heavenly, holy, perfection. Uh, it's a picture of the, the heavens because the sky is blue. So we, we think of blue and, and think of the Lord when we think of blue, you know, that's his color. And of course, the flag uh, is actually uh, a prayer shawl for Israel. It's just a giant prayer shawl, but it's blue and white. And those, are the, those are the Jewish colors. Uh, the loops are to be fastened onto um, 50 knobs of gold, and of course we know that gold represents kingship and deity. Um, these curtains were to be the, the inner tent covering for the um, tabernacle. So they were beautiful, but nobody was gonna see them from the outside. You have to go in to see it. So there's a picture there, you know, it's what's inside that really is beautiful and what really counts and what the Lord really considers. It's not the outer beauty. So uh, let's read seven through 13. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. Now this was to be a second covering. 11 curtains you shall make. So it's going to be a little bit bigger. The length, of each the length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits, and the breadth of each curtain 4 cubits. The 11 curtains shall be the same size, and you shall couple 5 curtains by themselves and 6 by themselves. And the 6th curtain you shall double over the front of the tent. So now we know why there's an extra, extra curtain for this one. 
You shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain on the outermost for the second set. And let's see, I was going to go to 13. And you shall make 50 clasps of bronze. And this time, the inner part was gold, where God was going to be inside, you know. But now, now the second clasps are bronze. What does bronze represent? Judgment. Judgment. Put the clasp into the loops and couple the tent together so it may be a single whole. And the part that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang ba on the back of the tabernacle. And the extra that remains on the length of the curtains, the cubit on one side and the cubit on the other side, shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and that side to cover it. Uh, okay, I'll, s I'll go ahead and read one more. And you shall make for a tent a covering of... Uh, I'll stop there. That I don't know why they broke that there. Sorry. Um, I'll stick to my King James, I guess. Uh, so let's go back. Uh, it's made out of goat's hair, black goat's hair. And of course, what did they do on, the, on Yom Kippur? They had two goats. One, one was a scapegoat. One was the Lord's goat. The scapegoat was tied with a ribbon. Uh, it was red ribbon. And when it turned white, why that meant that God um, accepted the um, sacrifice. And they would either push the goat over a cliff or they'd send him out into the wilderness to die. It's kind of a sad thing, but that's, that's what they did. He was taking the sins from the people. And so it's a picture of Jesus. And so that to be the, this tent cover covering with its brass, Knobs with the judgment was a picture, you know, of covering that. So they were, let me see if I got the, uh, they were 45 feet long. So you see that they were a little bit longer. Um, instead of 10, the 11th was to be folded over. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and read 14 through 25. And you shall make a tent for the tent, a covering of tanned ram skins and a covering of goat skins on top. Um, this version is different than King James and my Septuagint. It, this one says that they're dyed red. Yeah, yeah. That in in the Septuagint, which was the the uh, Old Testament uh, that was around when Jesus was alive on, on the earth. Um, it was uh, the Jewish Old Testament, but it was, it was translated into Greek. So uh, this is what they say. They s call this, ra uh, you shall make it out of ram skins, Adam. Adam refers to Adam but it goes clear back to what the word Adam means. We know that it means of the earth, but it also means red because Dom is, is blood. So Adam is, he had red. Well, because you can see our, we can see when we're alive, we can see that we're red, <laughs> that the blood is red. Okay, so um, that is where it comes. It's called like red man is really what I guess the literal translation would be. So. They would, it was insinuating that the skins were dyed red. I just thought it was interesting that that was the phrase that it, they used, Adam, meaning dyed red. And uh, let's see, how was that? How far was that to go? That was to go to 25, okay. Um, where did I stop? I guess I stopped on four, 14, okay. I'm gonna continue with that. Now it says in, in this one, it said a covering, a, uh, of goat skins on top. I don't know where they got goat skins. It was, in the King James, it says badger skins, and we've talked about that before. They don't have badgers there. Most people now believe that it was dolphin or porpoise skins because they would have been tough, you know. But whatever that was, it was the same thing they used for their shoes, for their sandals that did not ever wear out. So, um, it would have been the top covering and um, the only thing that you would see, you know, from the outside. 
Now you shall make upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. And here, everything in it, all the wood is acacia because that's what they had there. But it's very significant as to um, Jesus because that was used in the cross. They believe that that was the wood. They found actually found pieces of acacia wood on crosses. Ten cubits shall be the length of a frame, and a cubit and a half the breadth of each frame, and there shall be two tenons in each frame for fitting together. And so you, you do for all the frames of the tabernacle. And you shall make the frames of the tabernacle, 20 frames for the south side, 40 bases of silver you shall make under the 20 frames, two bases under one frame for its two tenons, two bases under the next frame for its two tenons, and for the second side of the tabernacle on the fourth side, 20 frames, and there 40 bases of silver, two bases under one frame, and two bases under the next frame. Are we mixed up yet? <laughs> <laughs> and for the year of the tabernacle, for the rear of the tabernacle, westward you shall make six frames, and you shall make two frames of four corners of the tabernacle in the rear, and they shall be separate beneath, but joined at the top for the first ring. Thus it shall be with both of them, and they shall form two corners. And there shall be eight frames with their bases of silver, 16 bases, two bases under one frame, and two bases under another frame. Okay, I am so... <laughs> I know, this This is the English version. I don't know. They, they're... It's crazy. But anyway, I'm so glad I wasn't involved in this because I would be so mixed up by now I wouldn't know. And of course, and you know, and the Lord says twice, you know, be sure you follow my directions. <laughs> I don't know. He must have given them clarity. I believe he did give them absolute clarity when they were working, you know, each person. Um, he also gave it to the women because they followed <laughs> yeah, yeah, the men, <laughs> the men do it and then they, if, totally. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then if they run into big trouble, finally they'll go to the directions at the very last, you know. <laughs> Where were those? <laughs> How many priests were in the tabernacle? Well, um, How it's, are we get there? I don't think it ever says. It's, it's all of the family of, the, um, of Aaron. And so um, his, it started out with his sons. He had four sons that, that are listed. And uh, so, but then it says that it took 300 to pack this all up and to keep it going. Um, I think Josephus mentioned that in his writings. So, um, yeah, it was a big job. I mean, and this is heavy stuff. You know, they'd have to set it up, you know, and then they'd take care of everything. And then it was time to move when the, when the Lord moved the, the uh, Shekinah glory, why? was time to move and so then they have to pack everything up and get everything going I mean it was it was so not an easy thing well it's uh, it said that it was like what a ton and a half of gold alone and then over two tons of brass and over four tons no two tons of silver and over four tons of brass alone not to mention the wood and everything and, and the tents and you imagine how heavy those tents would be all hooked together. That yeah, that. And when we get to the veil, <laughs> the veil was, you know, I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So yeah, it was quite an immense job. And uh, that was their job. When they got into the uh, promised land, they were not given any land. The, the priests were not given any land. They were the only, only tribe that was not given land uh, because they were responsible for the tabernacle and the temple later on. And that was their job. The people were to take care of them, just like we take care of our pastors, supposedly. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to anyway, and our workers and everything, because they had their job. And so um, that's the way God set it up. Okay, uh, these boards, what they did, it wasn't a solid thing. It was kind of like a lattice, because if it was solid, it would be so much heavier and they need more materials and everything. So it was kind of a lattice just to hold up the tent. But it was strong, you know. And so that was the way it was set up. Um, 20 boards on one side, 20 on the other side. Six with two boards. You add those all together, 48 boards divisible by three. <laughs> so now it says, t uh, the word here is um, tannin. Was it tannin? T, it was T, a T word. 
Yeah, tenons, T-E-N-O-N-S. Excuse me, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'll just say tenons. I looked it up because I didn't know what it was. And um, the word they use is hand for that. The board has two hands. So it was yod, yod is a hand. And that those hands were to fit in those sil silver sockets. Silver is redemption. So those sockets fit down on, I mean those um, hands fit down on the silver sockets. I w I'm thinking like a peg, maybe the, you know, kind of fit like that. So let's go ahead and read 30, 26 to 35. You shall make bars of acacia wood, um, five for the frames on one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames on the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames on the side of the tabernacle to the rear westward. The middle bar, halfway up the frame, shall run from end to end, and you shall overlay the frames with gold, and shall make their rings of gold for holders for the bars, and you shall overlay the bars with gold. Everything is covered. And then you shall erect the tabernacle according to the plan for that you were shown on the mountain. Okay, uh, and you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, and it shall be made from carabim, or with carabim, carefully worked into it. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold. So all those boards had to be covered with gold. And you don't see any wood, you just see gold on everything. Um, uh, let's see, uh, hooks of gold, and on four bases of the silver, and you shall hang on the veil, hang the veil from the clasp, and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil, and the veil shall uh, separate for you the holy place from the most holy. And you shall put the mercy seat on the ark of testimony in the most holy place, and you shall set the table outside the veil, and the lamp side on, Lamps stand on the south side of the tabernacle opposite the table, and you shall put the table on the north side. Okay, I'm going to put my little drawing up here so you can get a picture of how everything's going or a reminder. Here's the entrance, and remember we talked about the, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. This they called the way. And then here would be the altar burnt offering. Here would be the wash area that they would wash in. And this is the door into the actual tabernacle. And that was called the truth. And then you go beyond the veil. The veil was the life. So when Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was talking about that. They knew. We don't know until we're told. We didn't make the connection because it's not actually in scripture where this came from. This was just in the Talmud. The, the Jews and Josephus talks about it, I believe, too. That's, that's how they knew what he was speaking of when he said that. that he, he was the only way to God. Of course, this is where God was, where he, where he lived at the time. Okay, so, uh, yeah, yeah it, I, don't, I don't believe it's in the, tor in the in scripture. Um, so the table of showbread would go on, here's, this is north, north, south, east, west. So the table of showbread went on the north, the menorah went on the south side. And this is the altar of, of incense. This was where um, John the Baptist's father was, when Gabriel came to him, he was taking care of the incense. Okay. And this is where the veil's going to be. This is the placement of the Ark of the Covenant, right in there. It's really dark. It's only the menorah yeah. Light. Yeah. But, but when God came down, I'm sure there was plenty of. <laughs> <laughs> but um, notice that this is a cube. Okay. Let me find. I'm kind of jumping ahead here. Um, if I can find Revelation. I guess we'll get back to that because I don't know where it is, but I'll, I want to talk about the cube later. Just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, let me see, where are we here? Um, 
Uh, let's see, I talked about, um, you know, I'm, I kind of missed my notes here. Let me go back a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the uh, RAM. Uh, w one, of the, one of the tents, I really want to cover this, because one of the tents covering was RAM skin. Or uh, goats, which would be a ram. Okay, remember the ram's horn that was caught in the thorn bush when Abraham... Uh, Went, took uh, Isaac up to Mount Moriah. His, his horn was caught. Okay, the horn from that ram became the shofar that God used. Now, a picture of that. It's, it's the warning, it's the announcement. You know, whenever there's the shofar is blown, and by the way, they will blow that tonight at the end of their service. They'll blow it three times. Um, I just wanted to make that point there about it. You know, I didn't want to forget that uh, with the b about the horn. Okay, um, let me go back here. Uh, okay, now uh, the uh, we're talking about the veil now. That's really a, an important part of the tabernacle. It was to be woven of fine linen uh, and uh, decorated with blue, purple, and scarlet thread uh, to make the carabim. Um, it was hung on four corners. Remember, four is a picture of the world, so it was you know, a picture of, for everybody, you know. <laughs> Pillars of uh, acacia and they were to be covered in gold. Everything was gold, 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 gold. Like, you just can't imagine what. And when you think of the temple and how great that was, I mean, that was amazing, amazing. Um, during, um, well, I'll skip on that. I'll take that later. Um, Looking at Yom Kippur today, um, this was the one day of the year that the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. All the rest of the time, nobody went in there. He was the only one that was to go in. And next week we're gonna look at his um, vestments, what he was to wear on that day, and um, see what that's all about. But he was to, he was the only one that was going to make the sacrifices for everyone. And first of all, he had to make his own sacrifice. So he was a bloody mess that day. He really had to go through a lot. I, I can't remember, it was like, uh, I shouldn't even guess, but it, I think it was 30 some animals or something he had to do, maybe even more, but it was a lot. It was almost more, I can't even imagine how he could do it all. <coughs> so he was a real bloody mess. But he was the only one that was allowed to do that. And then he would have to dress in his priestly garbs for that particular thing and then uh, go in and uh, put the blood on the Holy of Holies and the, on the um, um, mercy seat, <laughs> on the mercy seat. So thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, this veil, how thick was it? Well, Josephus said it was four feet, four inches thick. Now, I have read in other places that by the time uh, uh, Jesus was on earth, it was a lot thicker than that. And uh, you wanna know, well, why in the world did they make it so thick? They said because they didn't wanna take any chances that anyone would accidentally fall through it and fall into the Holy of Holies, that would, that would be death. And so it was very, very thick. And the reason why it kept getting thicker is because they did not, as it started to wear, they would just put another one on there. And they kept building it rather than replacing it. So they just kept adding and adding and adding. So interesting thing. And I, you know, it was probably destroyed and they had to start over. I don't know the history of all that, but we do know that the temple was destroyed when Babylon uh, conquered them so uh, in, in 500 something so uh, 
I'm assuming that would have had to been replaced at that time. So interesting things. Um, we know that that was the divider between the holy place and the most holy. Uh, and it's a picture of separating just as we are, were separated from God before Jesus was, able, was given his life and, and uh, sacrificed. Uh, um, <coughs> let's go to Matthew um, 27, 51. Okay, um, and it says, and behold, the curtain of the temple. Now this was uh, at the time that Jesus died on the cross. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split and the tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Okay, so it was rent from top to bottom. Um, that's even harder to do than bottom to top, but as thick as it was. Now, Josephus said that it was so thick that the horses tied to each side couldn't pull it apart. That's how strong it was. So when Messiah fulfilled everything, he fulfilled the complete law of what the, the, what the tabernacle, the tabernacle was promising the ful fulfillment, it wasn't the fulfillment, but it promised the ful fulfillment, and so when Jesus fulfilled it, that veil was rent by God, saying, you're now able to come to me through Jesus. Now, the veil in the temple was 60 feet high and 30 feet wide. That was a big, big, big curtain, big veil. Okay, we're gonna go back now to verse 32 and it talks about the hooks. I wanna, wanna talk about those for a minute. Oh. You won't be able to show the last one because this power for some reason shorted out. Okay. Because I had one plugged in the battery's dead. Okay, well, we'll watch it next week then. Okay. There'll be no video this week. Uh, we had a little technical problem. So next week, hopefully, we'll get that fixed. Okay, we're going to look at 32. The word here is hooks. Uh, if it's in this Bible, I hope it is. Yeah. Um, hooks of gold. Okay, now in, um, in Hebrew, that word is vav. And if you know your Hebrew alphabet, you know that that is a letter, the letter vav. And it looks like a little hook when you look at it. It looks like, kind of like that. Looks like a hook. Okay. Now, you know that the, the letters of the alphabet have numerical meanings and they also have a symbol. And the symbol for Vav uh, means to secure. So that kind of goes right along with hook. Um, the Torah is said to be a picture of God's tabernacle where he abides. So when we read the first five books in particular, and that's the Torah, um, God is living in there. He's the living word. He is the word. And, and they, they say this is where God lives within that. Okay. Well, the Torah also has curtains, just like the tabernacle had curtains. And what do I mean by that? When you have a scroll... Let me draw a picture of it so you can get a better picture. You got your scroll rolled out here. You've all seen what the scroll looks like. They got a little wooden peg, you know, that they roll it up on and they roll both ends together and they roll it out, and there's no markings, you know, they don't have verses marked or anything like that, so <laughs> they gotta be pretty good, they gotta know it so they can find it. 
because they unroll it and now oh, here it is here okay so this is sewn together now this is in the ancient days you know this is how it was they would sew these pieces together for the scroll each one of these would be like a page so like that and so this was called um, a column Oh, let's see. Um, oh. Okay, so on each one of these, they had a vob. <laughs> on every one of those, a vob, a hook. Just like they used hooks in the tabernacle. Isn't that strange? <laughs> I mean, it kind of seems... But yeah, when they roll that, when they roll that up, and then when they when they read whatever it is, why then they'll roll it back together, and then they'll carry it on their shoulders and put it away in a special place. So you see the connection between the bobs, the hooks there. So each one of those has one of those. Um, now. Let's finish reading uh, 36 and 37. It says, You shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and, and fine twine linen embroidered with needlework. Now here it says embroidered with needlework here. And you shall make the screen five pillars of acacia and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold and you shall cast five bas bases of bronze on them. So this was the screen door um, this was for the outer door, and it was to have um, five pillars overlaid with gold to cover it. Okay, let's go on, and 27 is pretty short, so I want to just cover that today, so let's go ahead and read it. Uh, you shall make a, the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad, and the altar shall be square, and the height shall be three cubits. Um, so here we have the, uh, the altar, which is put it back up here. This is where the first thing you, when you walk in, there'll be the altar there. Okay, and you notice it's square, too. Okay, <coughs> so you shall make horns on each four corners. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. So the whole thing had to be made out of one piece, evidently, and just with horns, rather than attaching the horns on. They had to be part of it. Um, you shall make pots for it to receive its ashes, and shovels and basins and forks and fire pans, and you shall make all the utensil utensils of bronze. You shall make it for a grating, a network of bronze, and on the net you shall make four bronze rings with its four corners, and you shall set it on under the edge of the altar so that the net extends halfway o down the altar, and you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze, and the poles shall be put through the rings so that the poles on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. So evidently they had to carry everything, they couldn't really touch it. They, once it was all set up, they had to just carry it on poles. You shall make it hollow with boards, as it has been shown you on the mountain, it shall be made. So um, that would make it less heavy, I guess, to carry. Uh, let's see. And this is, uh, so here. You shall make uh, the court of the tabernacle. On the south side of the court shall be hangings of fine twine linen, a hundred cubits uh, for one side, and its pillars and their twenty bases shall be of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their, and their fillets shall be uh, of silver. Likewise, for its length on the north side just shall be hangings of a hundred cubits long, and its pillars twenty, and its bases twenty of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillet, fillets shall be of silver for the the breadth of the court of the west side shall be hangings of 50 cubits with 10 pillars and 10 bases. And the breadth of the court on the 
front of the east shall be 50 cubits, and the hangings on one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits, with their three pillars and three bases, and on the other side of the hanging shall be 15 cubits, with their three pillars and three bases. For the gate of the court shall be a screen 20 cubits long, and of blue and purple and scarlet yarns, fine twined linen embroidered with needlework. And it shall be four pillars with them four bases, and all the pillars around the court shall be filleted with silver. And their hooks shall be of silver, and their bases of bronze, and the length of the court shall be a hundred cubits, the breadth fifty, and the height five cubits, with hangings of fine twined linen and bases of bronze. All the utensils of the tabernacle for every use, and all of its pegs, and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. Okay. Now, what that all is about is the, the, the fencing around it. It was just to be a white, white fencing around. And that was just about all you could see. I have a video, uh, the, a, a replica that was set up in Timna, Israel. It's in the lower part of Israel. And um, they built it just like this. And um, for unfortunately, we can't show it today. But hopefully next week we'll, we'll show that. Uh, because, you know, it just gives you a perfect view of, of what it was like. Um, I think I have a picture here. Um, did I give you one of these last week? Did anybody get those? Did anybody at all? I didn't. I don't think so. Okay. Um, I thought I ran some of those off, but maybe you didn't get a double sheet like that. Okay, well, next week I'll, I'll run these off so you can have that because this is really an interesting little article because it, um, it lists scripture where Jesus is in the, in the sanctuary. I mean, pages and pages. I mean, I'll take you a long time to get through all of that if you want to research it, but uh, I'll, I'll try to run those off for next week. Okay, so... Where are we here? Um, the length of, on each side, well, I don't know. It says the length was 150 feet, the width was 90 feet, and it was seven and a half feet high. So when, we, when you looked at it, it would have been seven, the fence, fencing would have been seven and a half feet high. So that would have been all the way around the border here with the opening here. The only way that you could go in is right here. Okay. Um, they didn't have on all that outside stuff. They used bronze and silver. They didn't use the gold for the hooks and stuff, right? Um, I believe so. I believe so. I'd have to go back and check. <laughs> uh, I think so. Bronze, bronze and silver. Bronze for judgment, silver for redemption. Okay. Yeah, the the only w thing with gold was the inside part where where God is holy. You have to go through all of that other. You have to go through redemption to get to <laughs> to get to the uh, holy. Okay, the last part of this is the oil for the lamp. You shall command the people of Israel to bring you pure beaten olive oil. Uh, for the light, that a lamp may be regularly set to burn. And it had to be virgin, had to be the very first pressing. If you ever watched them make any oil, you know, there are several pressings. The first one is is to be dedicated to the Lord. And uh, then they, they, I can't remember the stages of it. There's one they use for medicinal purposes, and there's one they use for cooking, and one they use for um, lighting. Lighting is one of the last ones that they use for themselves. Yeah, so it just goes on down from that. Gold. That is kingship and deity. <coughs> There's. Uh, did you get one of these sheets? I did. I got one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it kind of lists all those. All right. Um, 
in the tent of the meeting outside the veil that is before the testimony, and of course the testimony would be the uh, Ten Commandments, Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening to morning before the Lord, and it shall be a statute forever to be observed throughout their generations for the people of Israel. They were to keep this light going, and I am assuming like the center lamp had to be going all the time. They had to keep that going all the time. In perpetuity, it said, forever it was to be going, supposedly, <laughs> as a picture of eternity, really, you know, salvation, eternity. Um, and here's where Aaron and his sons were um, committed to taking care of all of this. That was their job forever. They, they were to be the, you know, not, I shouldn't say forever, but throughout the generations. As long as they were uh, a people, you know, why they would be doing that, so. Are they still? Well, they aren't doing it now because there's no temple. <laughs> but so if they, they as soon as there's a temple, they're actually, uh, they've actually got the priests all ready to go. They've done DNA and they found people. If your name is Cohen, um, Cole, uh, there's so many names that are similar like that, you know, they've researched all that and they know, they know the different people that come from that tribe and um, they're, they've done all the DNA work and everything and they're, they've been training them and they're ready, ready to go. And so, yeah. And working with creating a, 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 spot, a spotless lamb, a blend. Oh yeah, the red heifer, the, the red heifer, yeah. They're doing that, they've been doing it. Yeah, for years. I mean, yeah. real <coughs> science dedicated just to that. So and here God just, What's that? God just have it. <laughs> so when when they get to go ahead to build, yeah, they're they're ready. It's gonna happen fast. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And there are there are those who say that you don't need a temple; they might just put up a tabernacle. Yeah. Um, because God's first dwelling place that yeah. actually makes more sense. So it's more logical than I mean, not in a physical. It's a physical it's aspect, exciting. <coughs> It's yeah. So the tabernacle would be like in his heart. <laughs> okay. <coughs> oh, okay. Uh, let me look at my notes here and see if what I've forgotten here. Um, so it was to be passed down from father to son throughout uh, generation to generation. That was their duty to take care of it. Um, and of course I mentioned before it takes took 300 feasts, priests to move the tabernacle and maintain it. Um, today we're the temple. <laughs> uh, and in, um, in glory there will be no need for a temple. Go to Revelation uh, 21, 22, and 23. I believe there will be a temple during the um, thousand years, the millennium, there will be a temple, but there will be Rev 20, uh, 21 and then uh, verses 22 and 23. Uh, there will be no need for a temple in eternity. <laughs> um, let's see, 20, I said 22, okay. And I saw no temple in the city, and this is after the, uh, the New Jerusalem came down. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Okay, that was it. <laughs> that is it, there. Um, First Kings, I wrote down First Kings, I don't know why I did. Let's, let's see, it's always an adventure for me too. Six, uh, 20, 
It has something to do with the... Is that somebody's car? Sounds like something out there. 620. Um, okay, here it is. Um, I believe this is talking about the uh, temple. Um, and during Solomon's time. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, 20 cubits high, and he overlaid it with pure gold, and he also overlaid the altar, an altar of cedar. And Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold, and he drew chains of gold across the front. Okay, so um, here it said the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. So he, this would have been the Holy of Holies. 20 cubits by 20 cubits. So it was a perfect cube, okay? Now go to Revelation uh, 21. Back to 21, and we'll go to 16 this time. And it describes the New Jerusalem. Uh, the city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with its rod, 12,000 stadia, and I don't know what that is in Greek. Um, let's see. It was, um, it says, about 1,380 miles. So it's going to be a huge, huge, I mean, there's room for everybody that ever lived in it, okay? But the, the fact is, New Jerusalem is a cube. Okay, the Holy Holies is a cube. So you see the connection there? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think that kind of wraps things up for now. Next week we're going to look at the clothing for the priests. And I think we'll probably take a couple of chapters to do that so we can... Uh, get through this a little quicker. Um, some, of, some of the chapters um, later on are just going to be them building this, so it's going to be kind of repetition, so we'll probably go through that pretty fast. Um, chapter 20, be 28. Um, and we'll look at, next week we'll look at the ephod and um, the stones and, and the, the Urim and the Thuman and uh, see what they all represent or try to figure it out anyway. It's still not, we don't know for sure, but there are many, many different ideas. And um, anyway, we're, we're heading towards the end of Exodus. So um, I'm just wondering if we want to continue on. I'd kind of like to wrap up uh, because this only covers about a year. The, ver the first, you know, it seems like we've been traveling forever <laughs> with them, you know, but it's only the first year. Uh, the uh, next book, um, I always get these all mixed up, which one's the next one? Number and Leviticus, okay. This, I think, starts, uh, I think, well, I'm not going to quote on that. I'll just wait. But anyway, um, I think we should go into some of these next uh, three books, because uh, there's some things, probably not fully, but just kind of pick through it and pick some of the, the most important things that we need to incorporate into the travel of things that happened after this first year, you know, just to kind of get a perspective on things. So uh, we'll kind of just jump around through these next three chapters for a little bit and, and take care of that. Then what I'd like to do next is, um, well, after Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is very important because According to Chuck Smith, Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy more than any other book. So I think it really is a good one for us to look at. And what I'd like to do in Deuteronomy is, is to compare Old and New Testaments, scriptures. You know, I think that'd be kind of fun to do, so we'll kind of go through that. But then after that would be Joshua, and I think that would be a real important one for us to follow up when they finally get there and, and what he was going through there. So um, that's kind of what we've got ahead for us. So um, 
Anybody have any questions, comments? This is a lot of, lot of numbers and details, but um, um, it's important for them to get these down and know these things. And I do believe, and uh, according to Josephus, um, he, he says that God gave each one of those people individually uh, extra knowledge about what they were to do, you know, and help them along. Because otherwise, you know, it's like a whole tent of people, you know, trying to create something, you know, and everything, every person has some different concept. So, uh, you know, God it really had to be in the works with this for it all come out the way he wanted it, which he can do easily. <laughs> Nothing is too hard. So any any comments or questions? I kind of jumped around a lot today because I, I thought I was organized, but you know me. It's just the way I am. <laughs> no, thank you. So if not, why, we'll just uh, finish up in prayer and uh, thank the Lord for a beautiful day. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for all this uh, little bits of knowledge that you give us, Lord, all pointing to your son, and we thank you so much for all of that. And it gives us courage, Lord, to know uh, you're still in control, nothing has changed, and uh, you still have a plan. And um, we just give all of our worries and our thoughts to you, Lord, and let you um, carry on just knowing that if we have a job to do that you want us to do, that um, we're willing, Lord, we're here. And so thank you again, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. Has anyone heard about how long he was doing? <sighs> well, I've got...